Hallelujah. Amen. We got some folks back here in the back from Washington State. That's a long way to go to get to prayer meeting, don't you think? <laughs> they stopped by to see us. They're headed on down to Atlanta, and we're glad to have them. Washington State. Amen. Have anybody else visiting with us tonight? First time? All right. We've got some folks back here in the middle. Where are you folks from? All right, but that's your home, folks. Amen. Blunt County is God's territory. That's beautiful. Yes, sir. Blunt County. I mean, you can see those mountains from there. Well, it's good to be here. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. We have, uh, I get a lot of emails from people making reference to our music. They say, boy, we, we like that old-fashioned music that you all sing in there. You know, they don't hear a lot of that, and, you know, a lot of these choreographed and orchestrated places that uh, they just hear the old-fashioned, and they say, there's just something about that old-fashioned music, Amen. and it's just something about that old-fashioned Bible. Amen. There's something about that old-fashioned faith. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, old, the prophet in the Old Testament said, return to the old paths. Old paths. Well, it's good. Let's see who we got here tonight singing. Brother Keith. Tickell, is he here? Did he bring you over here and drop you off? There he is. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. It's only by God's grace that I'm even here, standing here. His mercy and love is absolutely phenomenal to me. And I know that uh, I was thinking about the Apostle Paul and how three times the affliction that he prayed for, and uh, he asked it to depart, and the Lord said, no. What did he say? My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul most gladly will I rather glory in my infirmities than the power of Christ that he may rest in me, upon me. And I thought about Annie Johnson Flint, trying to catch my breath here. She is a beautiful songwriter back in the 1800s. And uh, she knew all about pain and suffering. We all do. And uh, during that time, she came to know and understand with deep insurance what the Apostle Paul was talking about. And uh, she knew that the Lord Jesus Christ and His grace, His love, is just boundless. His power is boundless. His mercy is boundless and powerful. And uh, it's, he knew, she knew that God would supply all her needs according to His riches and glory. Amen. So she was able to write and pen this song that you've heard. When the burdens grow greater, he sendeth more strength. When the labors increase, to added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. His love has no limits, his grace has no measure. His power no boundary known unto men. For out of His infinite riches in Jesus, He giveth and giveth and giveth again. When we have exhausted our store of endurance when our strength has failed ere the day is half done when we reach the end of our hoarded resources our father's full giving has only begun his love has no his grace has no measure, His power no boundary, no none to man. For out of His infinite riches in Jesus, He giveth and giveth and giveth us. 
fear not that thy need shall exceed his provision. Our God ever yearns his resources to share. Lean hard on his arm everlasting, availing our Father both thee and thy has no measure his power no boundary no none to men for out of his infinite riches in Jesus he giveth and giveth and God's the greatest giver. Yes. Yes, he is. Turn the book of Proverbs with me tonight, chapter 3. Go to verse number 5. Proverbs chapter number 3 and verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel, and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty. Thy presses shall burst out with new wine. My son... Despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. Father, I pray now, Lord, that you'd anoint the messenger as your word goes forth. Your promise in Scripture is that it shall not return unto you void, but it shall accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. The seed is perfect and the seed is good. The issue is never with the seed. The issue is the one who gives it and the one who receives it. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Be seated for a moment. I'll speak to you for a few minutes. Now, all of you, I'm sure, are aware of this. Some of you possibly might not be, but I would find that hard to believe that this past Sunday... A demon-possessed madman went into a church in Texas and shot to death 26 people. And uh, I don't know what the figure is, 15, 20 were injured. I don't know how many are still in the hospital. But uh, it gained national attention quickly because it was the greatest massacre to take place inside a church house in the, st in the, in the history of Texas and the history of the country. So it goes into that list of superlatives that we've seen happen this year over and over and over and over, greatest hurricane, most people killed, greatest this, greatest earthquake, earthquake this, that, this, that, over and over and over again, all of these superlatives. And, uh, and here we are now in Texas, and 26 people shot to death. There was a mother in Texas who had three children, I think it's three, and she loved her children dearly. And she had said time and again that she would die for her children. And when this monster came into that church and started going from aisle to aisle, shooting people, shooting little children indiscriminately, he came to her. She covered her children with her body, and he shot her, and she died, and two of her children died. She was doing everything she could to protect them, and I think one lived. And, uh, and of course, you all have read the stories, too, and you know what went on in there, the screaming and the crying and... And it was, I don't know of a worse horror on the face of this earth that could have been in there. If you, you, it's, it's, you just can't imagine what it would have been like to be in there. But now, 
I would say to any young woman right now, to, to a young teenage girl, there's your role model. That's a hero. That's a real hero. Not somebody been that's being paid millions of dollars to run up and down a field and play a game. That's not a hero. And that's not a role model. Because you're looking at courage and love. And I mean real courage and real love. And that's the kind of thing that should inspire you. Because this is set in contrast to a coward. See, this man is a coward. He, when he went outside and a man confronted him with a weapon, you know, so he, he comes up against somebody that's armed like he is. Uh, he jumps in his vehicle and he takes off and he calls his dad while he's on the way. And he's fleeing for his life. And he says, and it's almost unbelievable that to, to put it in context. He says to his dad, I don't think I'm going to survive. And I think to myself, what difference does it make, man? You just murdered 26 people. You died back there. Huh. You're not going to survive. If, when you, when you, when you, you, cannot, you cannot take human life like that and think you'll ever live again. You won't do it. You're not going to live. You may exist, but your, 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 your existence will be as a dead man. But in any event, what followed that is a lot of uncertainty. And the people down there, they're praying and they're trying to find answers and they're, they're looking to each other for strength and comfort. And that's all good. And they need all the comfort they can get. They need all the prayers they can get. And, uh, and a lot of people are pouring, they're pouring their hearts out to them and they're pouring out love and compassion for them. And that's good. That's the way it ought to be. Uh, it's just it's 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 just horrendous. Uh, but immediately the question comes up in the national media: Well, if a God of love, if He's a God of love and He's a sovereign God, why would He let anything like that happen? The question always arises, uh, usually by the same people who are pushing for more gun control. You need to be reminded, folks, that it was a good man with a gun that stopped a bad man with a gun. If that good man with a gun had not been there, no telling how many more people he would have killed. That's fact. So a good man with a gun stopped a bad man with a gun. And it's a shame that either one has to have a gun. Wouldn't it be wonderful to live in a world with peace that you don't have to lock your doors at night? We had a brother here. He's a brother in our church right here. They broke into him this past Sunday, robbed him blind. That's the world we live in. It's full of thieves and murderers. That's the reality of it. This is why I quote you Luke chapter 22 all the time when the Lord said, go buy a sword, buy a sword, arm yourself. And of course it is all across the country. They've been doing surveys now and churches everywhere. They have guards and they have surveillance systems and the people are armed and all of that. That's a shame, isn't it? There was a time when our country, when the country, when they left the church doors open 24 hours a day, you could go there any time you wanted to and you could pray. Uh, it's wake up call tonight. Something's happened in America. How many of y'all agree with that tonight? Something has happened in this country. And I'm afraid the people that caused this to happen, the Darwinians, the ones who are producing these atheists, and this man goes into this church and he's using all kinds of blasphemous four-letter words, and he's been preaching on the Internet, on his Facebook page and so forth, that he's an atheist. Of course, he's not now, but he's been preaching that he's an atheist. You know, it doesn't take a second after you leave this world before you find out there's another world and you're not welcome. If you're an atheist, you're not welcome. You don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. But he's preaching, he's preaching his atheism. Where'd that come from? See, while the church let this stuff seep in under the guise of education, the, full, the school system's full of it. They get our kids and brainwash them. They teach them that's scientific and it's not scientific. Henry Morris spent his whole lifetime debunking atheism along with a lot of other men. And Henry Morris, was a, uh, he was a scientist and was fully capable and well qualified to do it. Spent his whole lifetime debunking atheism. But in any event, that's what they're fed. And so the people down there have to go on now. And, you know, it wiped out eight members of one family. And, uh, you know, it's a little old town, four or five hundred people. You get... 25 or 30 people die, you've wiped out a big portion of the town. What a thing, man. Here are these poor people are going to church on a Sunday morning and a monster walks in and he starts killing them. What a thing. 
Just, just let, let, the, let the gravity of it settle in for a minute. They went to a house of worship to talk to the Lord. In one case, when, they, when this monster came around the corner and he was aiming his weapon at one of the, uh, one of the uh, Christians in there, the Christian that was with her said, it's okay, we're, we're going to heaven now. They both knew he, he, was, he was going to shoot them. It's okay, we're going to heaven. We're going to heaven. <laughs> now that's the kind of thing right there that inspires me. We're going to heaven today. You see, he couldn't take that away from them. Don't fear him that can destroy the body. Yea, I forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him that can destroy both body and soul in hell. Amen. If you ever had any doubt in your mind that there's a hell and a reason for a hell, you just saw it Sunday. Okay? You just saw it. There's a lot of different reasons for hell, but that's one of the primary right there. One of the primary reasons. So what do you do? How do you go on with your life? What would you tell these people down there in Texas if, say, that you ran into them or they're members of your family, extended family, or your friends? Or What would you tell them if they said to you, I don't want to live. I have, no, I have no purpose in life now. Everything I've got's gone. And I tried to live for God, and why did he let that happen to me? What would you tell them? You see, this is what gets down to the rubber meeting the road. The scripture says, lean not to thine own understanding. God's going to do things that we don't understand. And we have to come back to the square one, and we have to either believe in the sovereignty of God, that he's going to work it for right and work it for good, and there's a reason in it, and God will glorify himself through it, or we don't. Because if we don't come back to square one and deal with the issue, it's going to haunt us, and it's going to eat like a cancer at our soul. And it'll eat your faith up. And then you may live in a shell for the rest of your Christian life and put on a facade. And, you know, this is the outward pe pe person people see on Sunday. But the real man or the real woman died. Their faith's dead. You say, well, anybody like that? Oh, yes, there are plenty of people like that. Plenty of people like that. Uh, you have to come down to this simple fact. Things are going to happen that, are, that have no explanation. That's why it says, lean not to thine own understanding. Human understanding is incapable of grasping the sovereign God and his will, which is so much higher than ours. His ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Now, I don't have anybody lying dead down there in Texas. I didn't lose a wife or a husband or a son or a daughter or a brother or a sister. It's awfully easy, like these liberals in the country have been going on bad-mouthing some of the things that went on in Texas. I marvel. I marvel at their arrogance, you know. I wonder what they would have done had they been in that building that day. So easy to run your mouth. But you see, this is, applies to me, too. It applies to me, too. I didn't lose anyone in Texas. I didn't lose anyone in Texas. You know, I can stand up tonight, and I can give you out what the Scripture says. But what if it did happen to me, or what if it happened to you? What if it came to our home? How would we deal with it? Could we live with it? You say, well, preacher, I could live with it if I could take care of it and get it straightened up. No, sometimes you can't straighten it up. Sometimes you can't do anything that's going to change what happened, and you can't do anything to bring justice to the issue. What justice was done? His life wasn't worth the lives of 26 people. You agree? How many agree with that? So he's dead, but his life is not worth 26 people. You see what I mean? That's not justice. Justice will come when the judge judges. That's what the great white throne's about. Justice will come one day when the judge judges. So I'm going to give you a few things tonight. And uh, Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 23 says, Oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Meditate on that. Jeremiah said, I know that I'm incapable of living my life and living it right. Isn't that something? In other words, I need the direct hand, the sovereign hand of God. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. He'll direct you. See, you can't direct yourself. You can't do it. And, of course, there's a lot of reasons for that. We don't have time all that tonight. 
Proverbs chapter 20, verse 24 said, Man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? See, how can I even understand? And so many things make no sense, do they? They make no sense. They're not going to make any sense. Not going to make any sense. Second Chronicles 20, verse 12, Our God, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And that's the key. Keep your eyes upon the Lord, and there'll be comfort for you. You may not get much comfort right off the bat, but there will be comfort if you keep your eyes on the Lord. Psalm 89, verse 26 says, He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Amen. When you turn from him, if you get mad at God, and I guess all of us do it one time or another to one degree or another, we might get a little mad at God, angry with him, burned out or something. I'm going to ask you a simple question. Where are you going? That's why Peter said, to whom shall we go? There's nowhere to go. That's a message in itself. <laughs> all the places you could go. And there's nowhere to go. He said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Psalm chapter number 18, verse number 2, talks about the Lord being a rock. He said, He's my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I trust, my buckler, the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. Amen. He's called the rock a lot of times in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter number 8, verse number 15 says that they had water from the rock, the rock of Flint. Water came out of the rock. You have to have water to live. Exodus chapter number 33, verse 22. The Bible says that God hid Moses in the cliff to the rock. He hid him. God's a good God. Somebody said, I want to see his glory. You ready to go? <laughs> if you're ready to take the full glory of God in tonight, see you later. <laughs> you won't make it. You can't look on that glory yet. We will see it. But not here in this flesh. There is no way. Moses took the idea of the rock and he used it as a symbology, a symbol. Deuteronomy chapter number 32 verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. Moses called God the rock. Amen. And verse number uh, 13, he said, He made him ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the field. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. My, it's an amazing thing, don't you think? Water from a rock, oil from a rock, honey from a rock. I didn't know rocks produced oil, honey, and water. Isn't that amazing? For who is God save the Lord, Jehovah? And who is a rock save our God? 2 Samuel chapter number 22 and verse 32. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. Now the Lord God is our rock, and he's the rock of our salvation. And when you begin to think about this, because this in one sense can be used as what we call a metaphor. So what's a metaphor? A metaphor is something that gives a light on something else. That's what it means. For, alongside of something, it sheds light on it. In other words, it's a, it's, a, it's a type of it, an illustration of it. So the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock of the my salvation. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 2. A man shall be as an hiding place from the wind and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. There's no more beautiful words in the English language than you just heard. The shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Isaiah chapter number 28, verse number 16. The apostle Paul quotes this in Romans 9, and here's what it says in Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion... For a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. 
He that believeth shall not make haste. Now, the Apostle Paul quotes this in Romans 9, verse 33, and watch the little change in the way he quotes it. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling block and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now, when he said a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, here's what it says back there where he quoted in Isaiah 28. Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. In plainer words, the rock of our salvation that we're standing on, if it is rejected, it becomes a stumbling stone. You can't get around it. In other words, if you reject the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are never going to walk straight again the rest of your life. I don't care what you try, where you go, who you know, you will never, be, you'll never have a foundation again for the rest of your life because the Lord Jesus Christ is the only foundation there is. And when we stand on him, that means we can stand on him and be secure, but we can also stand on him through the storm. And we can stand on him for divine protection. Amen. Be fed and sustained from the rock of our salvation. So what does anyone need when they go through the hardest times in life? They need the Lord. They need the Lord. The Apostle Paul quotes that, and he makes it very clear that, uh, that, uh, that this rock is our Lord Jesus Christ. But Yeshurun... Deuteronomy 32, verse 15, waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. And this is one of the greatest pitfalls that happens to most Christians. And that is when you're up and coming and you're walking with the Lord and you're humble and you're seeking him and you need him and you know where your food is coming from and the clothes on your back and he's starting to bring you out of debt and he's getting to where you, can, where you, where you think you're standing, then you start prospering and you start turning your back on the one who prospered you. Your shuren waxed fat, see, and then he lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Didn't need the Lord anymore. Didn't need him anymore. I remember a famous preacher, and I won't give his name out tonight. He's one of my brothers, and I love him greatly. But his daughter was married to a man, had a business. And the man he was married to had the business, served the Lord, loved the Lord, lived for the Lord, till his business started prospering. Then his business started prospering. He was making all kinds of money. He just began to drift away from the Lord. His money got between him and God. You ever wonder why some of you can't get two dimes to rub, to, to rub together? <laughs> I mean, it's from hand to mouth, week to week. You couldn't take a blessing. Can't stand it. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. There are Abrahams in the Bible, rich. There are Jobs in the Bible, rich, and became richer. But Job not only became richer, he became more spiritual. There are people in this country that you'll never hear about that give millions of dollars for the work of Christ. I've read about them. And they want to retain their anonymity. They don't want you to know who they are because they're doing it for the Lord. And they're promising God, you bless me, I'm going to bless you back. And they give, and they give, and they give. Maybe you'll learn one day the secret of giving, that you can't outgive God. You'll learn that secret. You'll learn, and you'll find out that God is the great abundant supplier who giveth us all things richly to enjoy. You give to him, God will give back to you, because what you gave to him, he gave to you. What do we have that we didn't receive of the Lord? Amen. So, the Bible said, Of the rock that beget thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Boy, how should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them, and the Lord had shut them up? You see, now, they have a rock, and we have a rock. 
They've got a God and we've got a God. Our God is the true and living God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Their God is the God of this world. He will use them and use them up and one day he will drop them when they need him the most. The Bible said their rock is not as our rock. Deuteronomy 32, 31. Even our enemies themselves being judges. <laughs> now think of what's going on here. Think about it. How many people do you think are watching you tonight? I don't know. No, you don't know. But somebody is watching you. It may be your next door neighbor. It may be that fellow you work with. It may be a member of your family. It may be somebody you've wronged in the past or you've done something for in the past. They're watching you. Well, preacher, I believe in preaching. So do I. And if you have to, use words. First time I heard that, I thought, now, what do you mean? Are you saying we don't need to preach verbally? You can scream to high heaven all you want to and make all the noise you want to, but I'm going to tell you right now, they're going to watch your life more than listen to your words. And if your words match up with your life, then they'll have power. This is why the Bible says in the Old Testament they let none of his words fall to the ground. See what I'm saying? When, 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 the, when, the, when the fire of brimstone was about to come down on Sodom and Gomorrah, the great preacher Lot began to preach to his family. Yeah. Remember Lot? Yeah. He's preaching to his family. He said, now get out of here. Judgment's coming. And the Bible said he sounded as one that mocked. That's yeah. why he'd never preached to them before, never had a prayer meeting with them before, never witnessed to them before. And now all of a sudden he's become religious. You see what I mean? I remember my pastor saying years ago, he said, shout glory to God, shout all you want to, but walk straight when you hit the floor. <laughs> That's good old time wisdom. In plain words, if you live right and you're living for the Lord and people know you are, well, they'll, glory, they'll shout with you. Amen. And a good shout's good every once in a while. I know some churches, it scare them to death if somebody shouted or they said amen. But, you know, they can scream their head off over here at this football stadium. Their rock is not as ours. Their vine is the vine of Sodom, fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are the grapes of gall. Clusters are bitter. Wine is the poison of dragons, cruel venom of asp. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, the things that shall come upon them make haste. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth their power is gone, and there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, Where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted? <clears throat> the Lord has a sense of irony. He will say to them one day that have turned their back on the church and on the truth, where are your gods that you trusted? You got your money, you got your health, you got your, you got your, you got your fame, you got your fortune, you got your friends, but one day you're going to lose all them. Where are your gods? You know what Elijah did at the top of Carmel, don't you? He mocked them. He did. <laughs> he said, where's your God? Boy, he made them mad. They jumped up and down and they, 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 they cursed the more and cut themselves and the blood gushed out. Oh, Baal, oh, Baal, oh, Baal. And Elijah just stood over there like that. <laughs> Shook his head. Oh, Baal can't hear you. Baal's dead. The only thing can hear you is these demons and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they're not going to move because this is God's day. And they didn't. Where are you gods? Hannah prayed this. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Amen. David praised God. Second Samuel, David spake to the Lord in the words of this song, the day the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all of his enemies, now the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord Jehovah is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. The God of my rock, and him will I trust. He is my shield, the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. So I'd say to these poor folks down there in Texas, I hope you're praying for them. 
I really don't. I'm sure you have. Pray for them. God bless them. Pray for them. They've been through it, and they're going to go through it. It's not over. And uh, I just, uh, I just, I don't know. I, I just can't. I can't. I can't make any sense out of it. I can't make a lick of sense out of it. I can't make any sense out of it. But boy, you can see the worst of humanity come out. You can see these political opportunists. You can see them pouncing on that. You can see them using that for their own purposes. Then you can see these so-called comics out here with their little snide remarks. One comic in his snide remark came out and said, what, well, didn't do any good to pray? Look at all these dead people down there. See? Can you imagine you lost your, you lost your children and you read what that, that so-called comic said? Can you imagine? That's cruelty. Now think about it in a minute. You live in a country that is hypersensitive to everything that's said, PC correct. You, nobody gets offended in America. You can't offend anybody except a Christian. You're fair game. You see what I mean? You're fair game. And so I don't know what he thought he was going to gain by saying that, but what good did your prayers do? You know, what good did they do? Yes, sir. That's why I said he was demon possessed. Absolutely, brother. You ain't making sense. No, no. I can't. Uh, thank God for the good guy with the gun. Thank God for the good guy with the gun. You better believe it. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. The way he started. Oh, yeah. The more God gave him, the more J.C. Penney gave him back. He increased what he gave him. And God just blessed him that much more. He sure did. Came from nothing and wound up in one of the biggest department stores in the country. He sure did. J.C. Penney was a Christian. No question about it. He wouldn't be open on Sunday either. <coughs> well, you know, just sure and waxed fat. <laughs> I talked about that tonight. Amen. I think sometimes with some folks it helps for them to talk about it, and I'm sure down there they're talking, and I'm sure they're having prayer meetings, and they're meeting and trying to comfort each other, and I'm sure a lot of people are coming, sending information into them to try to help them. And I, please don't leave them out of your prayers. Keep praying for them. Um, and there's a lot of other issues involved, too, because Satan wants to use something like that. Satan wants to use that to destroy the faith of a lot of people. Yes, sir. He wants to use it. He's an opportunist. He's an opportunist. Just like the so-called comic. What, what's, what comedy is in that? Good my goodness. I tell you, it's, um, it's, it's hypocrisy of the highest level. They can say anything in the world about a Christian. But you've got to be very careful that you don't offend anybody. See how it works? All right. A 14 year old daughter, their little girl now, their little girl's gone. Yes, sir. I told my wife the other night, I said, uh, you know, the thing with the amphipodas, and they said that they're going to, it's going to be doomsday basically on the fourth. And I told her, because of the Christian prayers, that that kind of diminished. But I noticed that it's really not a whole lot happening. I said, that's the power of prayer. And if we could just grasp a hold of that, to know that we can move. <coughs> Well, sure, there's a lot of things. You, like I said tonight, you know, <laughs> you can't make sense of it. Sure, there's a lot of plausible things. There could be a lot of things interacting together, a lot of, a lot of different things happening at the same time, a situation like that. 
Sure. I believe that's what I would have thought that point. Yeah. There's a lot of people that hate Christ, believe it or not. They hate the Lord Jesus. Well, he that letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. Right. And until that happens, Satan is on a on a, a leash, so to speak. He's not free to do as he pleases. All right. Anybody else have a prayer request tonight?